result of what's called the normalization movement for people with intellectual disabilities. That started in the United States at the end of the 60s and the early 70s. And it was from that small beginnings that there are citizen advocacy organizations actually all over the world. And what we do in Ottawa is that we work with people of all ages and all disabilities. So that means people with physical, intellectual, developmental, psychiatric, and age-related disabilities. So it's quite a, a wide portfolio. I'm going to try and give you a quick idea of all the things that we do. So at the heart of uh, citizen advocacy, it's the desire to reconnect people who become isolated from the ordinary community. I think you probably agree with me that within Western cultures, people with disabilities are often devalued. And I want to put devalued in quotation marks. Um, and because they're devalued, they're often very socially isolated. Our program goal is that through a connection with somebody who is valued, and again, that's in quotation marks, that it helps people see that people with disabilities should also be valued. And to put that really simply, we always like to say, remember back to when you were at school or you saw some kids playing on the school grounds and maybe there's a child at the side of the schoolyard who is not included in the activities that are going on in the schoolyard because that child has a disability. We know that for children, just going over, one child going over to be a friend of that person will mean that that child is included back into what uh, is going on in the school. And that's purely and simply what we're trying to do uh, in Ottawa through our many different programs. So we've got a whole lot of programs. I've given you a copy of that if you want to take it. So we have matching programs, creating a good life, and family support. And what I'd like to do is kind of just give you a quick overview of what all of those are so that you've got an idea of what resources are here in Ottawa. Because I know that you, as you go about your general day-to-day -day work, you're going to find, uh, you're going to meet people who have family members with disabilities who don't know about citizen advocacy. Or, you know, you're, you're going to meet uh, somebody who wants to volunteer somewhere wonderful. So let's, we'll talk about our Everyday Champions program first. This is what's called a matching program. And it's our, by far our biggest matching program. And what we do is that we match a person with a disability who could be anything from a child to a senior and anywhere in between. We've matched a child as young as two. And we'll match people you know, as old as you know, 92 or, or, or more. And what they mostly have in common is that they're lonely and isolated. They don't have people in their lives who choose to be in their life. It's what you and I would call a friend. They may have lots of people who are paid to be in their life, or they, if they're lucky, they'll still have family members around who are going to help them, but they don't have that special someone in their life who is their friend. And what we find when we match a volunteer in the community as an intentional friend to somebody with a disability is that it can have a profound effect on somebody with a disability. It can give them the sorts of benefits like increased self-esteem, better mental and physical health, and um, it gives them confidence to go out and try new things. And I can probably tell you uh, a quick, couple of quick stories that kind of illustrate that. The first one's about these two lovely gentlemen here. This is Dickens with the cap and Anthony. Dickens is one of the fewer people that we've had on our uh, roster of uh, people that we support who had a catastrophic accident. Um, and Dickens has, as well as physical disabilities, he has cognitive disabilities, and one of which is memory memory, really short-term memory loss. And the social work team, when they were asked to find a friend for Dickens, an advocate for Dickens, weren't actually sure that he would benefit from it or that the advocate, as we call a volunteer, would choose Dickens because they didn't know that he'd ever remember them. Or that he would, you know, get any of those benefits that we talked about before. But Anthony 
who uh, is looking to become a doctor, uh, said he was uh, game for this, and he chose Dickens. And over the 18 months, there's been a big change in Dickens. <coughs> Dickens actually does remember Anthony. He enjoys his time with him. His family know that he enjoys his time with him because he tells them. Um, and he also says his Connect Four skills have developed enormously because sometimes he can even be So that's one of the things that they do together. And Anthony talked about something that was really meaningful to him, which is uh, in terms of some a little bit of a difference that he's making. Um, and he said, when he first met Dickens, Dickens asked him what card he wanted. And Anthony would tell him. Dickens was not thrilled. Yeah. He wasn't happy with it. And then he'd ask him again, you know, five minutes later, what car do you drive? And Anthony would be very patient and tell him and go through the same response. We we think cars were pretty important to Dickens before his accident. And um, now Anthony says that Dickens actually still asks him the same question. But he can say to him, you know what car I drive, Dickens. And he goes, ah. <laughs> so, so that's kind of a different, uh, a very small difference, but it's something that's been really meaningful to both of them. I can tell you about another pair that uh, I don't have a picture of them here, but that would be Peter and John. So, <clears throat> Peter and John have actually been matched now for about eight years. John was one of what our social work team would say was very hard to match. He had a number of disabilities, and one of which was anxiety, and he was on our waiting list for over 10 years, believe it or not. And um, because he had this very high anxiety, he didn't get out. He couldn't leave his house. But Peter decided that John was the person for him, and they spent quite a lot of time getting to know each other, and Peter learned all about uh, John's wishes, his hopes, his dreams. And one of the very simple things that John wanted to do was to take a bus in Ottawa. Nobody had ever shown him how to take a bus, nor did he have the confidence to go out and do it himself. But through, you know, Peter's encouragement, and the encouragement of Peter's family, because Peter's family too also embraced John, John uh, has learned to take this. From that small beginnings of somebody who never went out, he goes everywhere by bus in Ottawa. He gained in confidence and he went to uh, change where he lived. He also went to um, find himself a part time job and he's on many of our committees at Citizen Advocacy. So that's what can happen with a Something as simple as just being uh, uh, befriended. Uh, uh, so I think this is a uh, opportunity to start uh, with. Well, pause for sure. That's good. Yeah. 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 Oh, wonderful. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay, good. Uh, he's going to put some back on again, I think. <coughs> so all that's gone. Warming up. I'll talk about one of our other matching programs, very similar to the Everyday Champion, but we call it Chance for Choice, and it's a match with, again, a volunteer from the community, but with somebody who has what's called an age-related disability. So this could be... So... When you have an age-related disability, this could be me in a few years' time, right? As you age, it start to fall off, I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so you may have um, vision problems, you may have hearing problems, you may have mobility problems. There's all sorts of what would be termed age-related disabilities. And what all of those people have in common is that, again, they're socially isolated and they're pretty vulnerable. Um, so it's, the idea is to try to get them back out into the community, to connect them back into the community by maybe just going out for something as simple as a cup of coffee. I mean, this, this is not a big deal uh, for our volunteers. Some of them do more. If I talk about, uh, again, a, a match within this program, I can talk about Sheldon and David. So Sheldon actually has a visual impairment. 
and he was fairly isolated. The what he wanted was a friend, an advocate to get out at least once a week. So David has been matched to him and they go, they go out for coffee, they go out for dinner, they might go out grocery shopping or get haircuts. Um, so that's all getting out of the house. But one of the other significant things that David has done for Sheldon, it's a really small thing, but it's made a really big difference in Sheldon's life, is that he actually, each week, he'll read to him, or each month, however often it comes, the newsletter for the apartment buildings that he lives in for the, for the complex. And there's a lot of activities that happen within that complex. And just for that simple fact that uh, David can tell Sheldon what is going on, Sheldon has been involved in the community life of his apartment buildings. So those are our uh, two big matching programs. We'll talk about numbers and stuff in the later. Just quickly tell you about some of the other programs, to give you an idea of the scope of what we, we do. So I want you to imagine that you have a child with a disability and you're, gonna, you're concerned about what's going to happen to your child and where maybe you're no longer here. So maybe you're, you're aging and you, you know that this child is going to outlive you and you don't want to put the burden just on any brothers or sisters that are, are there. Lifetime Network is a program that can help with that and, and many other issues. So what it is, is it's creating or providing a good life for a loved one, both now and in the future. So we have trained facilitators that work with each family, work with the person with the disability, to find out what they want and try to help put a circle of support around that person so that they are supported throughout their life. So say it's uh, the instance where you know, you've got aging parents and they want to make sure that this child has a great life uh, going forward. They may have invite people into their uh, circle. It could be neighbors and friends. So maybe it's very important for that uh, child they want to go to their church or their synagogue. And so a member of that church community said, that's what I will commit to do is to get them to that uh, church. Or it could be they have somebody on their, uh, within their network that says, I will help this person with grocery shopping every week, or I will help with the lease for the apartment, or I will help with finances. It's different things. Some of them are social things, and some of them are much more practical things. And that's what's called a lifetime network, and it's called that because they believe it's going to be for somebody's lifetime. And by having the facilitator, that's the person that is going to hold the network together going for the mum, dad, are no longer there. So in, if I could talk about one of the people within that uh, program, so Caroline, um, her net network at the moment, she's fairly young, she's in her 30s at the moment, she's fairly young and it's been a very, very much all about social things for her and health related. So she has friends within her network who have taught her things like learning how to text. She's also got people within her network for exercise. She loves to walk and she loves to swim. So there are people who are committing to do that. Uh, and at the minute she's looking for uh, a driver to help get her to her art classes every week. So that's the sort of thing that a network can do. It's very practical stuff as well as social. This is one of the newer programs within the organisation. Again, it's using an independent facilitator that uh, is paid to do this. And this is a new project that the Ministry of Community and Social Services are funding for two years. And it's, um, they are funding 352 spots in Ottawa for people with developmental disabilities to get better life outcomes for them. So a lot of uh, people are accessing this because it's a transitions, transitions in somebody's life. So one easy transition to talk about is what happens after somebody with a developmental disability finishes school, which in here is usually around the age of 21. It's what happens next. What are they going to do next in their, their life? What are their hopes, their dreams, their wishes? Do they want to live independently? Do they want to move out of mum and dad's home? What needs to happen? 
So the facilitator spends a lot of time with the person with the disability, finding out what they want, not what mum and dad says. They'll also talk to mum and dad, brothers, sisters, and extended family and friends <coughs> to find out what they think the person wants or needs and, the, and their capabilities. And then they work with the, the, the person and the family on a plan. So, um, and one person that I was told about um, has a developmental disability and he also has uh, vision loss. He actually can't, can't see. And he started this facilitation process and the facilitator said she was quite taken aback when she started, first started to ask him what his dreams were, his wishes were, because he said he wanted to drive a truck. <laughs> And so she said she started thinking, how do I get somebody who's blind to drive a truck? And maybe I could go to, you know, an enclosed uh, circuit, etc. But because they're facilitators, they actually don't take what somebody says the first time. They start digging deeper and deeper. And what she uh, came to realize was this uh, boy had, his dad was a truck driver. And his dad used to come back after every trip and tell him of all the places that he'd been and that he'd traveled. And really, when he said that he wanted to drive a truck, what he really was actually getting at was that he wanted to travel. So that was definitely part of his life plan. How could he travel? And uh, I understand that uh, they did plan and organize a very big trip for him back to Ireland. So. That's kind of uh, what independent facilitation and person directed planning is all about. I mean, there's a lot more to it than that. But we haven't got that. Uh, this, is, this is the newest program. This is called yeah, the Fecal Alcohol Resource Program. And it's quite a fascinating program. Again, it's only going to be around for two years at the moment in terms of funding. But <clears throat> there is a tremendous need for community navigation, finding services for people with FASD, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, a number of agencies within uh, the city need to develop their programs to take people with FASD uh, into them. When you have FASD, um, some people know a little bit about it because um, it used to be thought that it was only people who had very characteristic features, which was lower ears, particular, they, they lost whatever this bit of your um, face is called, this little bump here above your lip. Um, they used to think that it was only those people that were affected by alcohol. But what they've realized is that it, it actually encompasses a whole huge range of symptoms that can be uh, mistaken for autism, developmental disabilities, intellectual disabilities, um, even physical disabilities. It's, uh, it's a very big program, but with, once some, if somebody is diagnosed with FASD, there are not specific programs for them. And because they don't have the diagnosis of autism, they can't access those programs. So that's some of the stuff, the education work that this team is doing uh, with agencies within the city to help get these people um, some resources. And then they are helping with the navigation, directing families who are pretty desperate for some help for their kids because they tend to fall through the cracks. Uh, trying to help them get into access to programs. Um, so it's it's been under been going for about uh, six months now, and uh, the training portion of it is really getting well underway. And uh, they're pretty excited by a lot of the um, results that they're getting from uh, this FASD program. <clears throat> I don't know if you can see that. That's us walking in my shoes. This is uh, when we're getting to family support. Family support. So walking in my shoes is a monthly meeting for parents of children or youth with special needs. Just to meet each other, share experiences, maybe share resources. They have speakers in from time to time, uh, guest speakers. And I think the best testimonial I can give for this is to actually read something that one of the parents wrote about our Walking In My Shoes group. 
Um, it says, the first few weeks after my son's diagnosis were almost a complete haze. I remember just watching him and wondering about his future and our future. I had no friends that had a child with autism or anyone in our family that had autism. I just knew I had to talk. I remember attending my first women's meeting. It was a rainy night and I was unsure of what to expect. What I didn't expect was to find complete comfort and understanding for two hours. Every worry I had was normal. Everyone in that room had a child with a disability. Everyone had a story. Everyone had compassion. Wims is a safe place for any parent of a child with a disability to talk, listen, vent, you name it. No one judges you, everyone understands you. It's a safe haven. So that's a pretty significant uh, resource for families. And there is a group that meets in the West End and in the East End. So in the West End, they meet, I think it's the first Tuesday of the month, and they're meeting at the moment in um, the retirement home on at the bottom end of Eagleson. Bridalwood area. I can't think what it's called. Bridalwood Trails. Somewhere down there, yes. That's a retirement home. I don't think it's Bridalwood Trails retirement home, but. I'm talking about the bottom end trail west. Hmm? Bottom, bottom end of trail west on the uh, okay. west side of Eagleson. Yeah, I think so, yeah. So that's, that's where, where they're meeting. They are looking for a new home, so if anybody <coughs> knows of a free home. What about the Isle of Rotary home? Where's that? Something. No, they they. Is it? It's a home designed for children. With right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, they they they're looking for something, sort of a, from Westboro to Canata area along the easily accessible by the highway. So. Uh, they might talk to uh, Mike Tron, who's a Rotarian, member of the Rotary Club of West Ottawa. I know he has a severely disabled adult son. Okay. And uh, he is the uh, manager of all of the Riverview Community Retirement Homes. Oh, he's, a, he's a, There's Pridewood Trails, there's Carling. Can, can somebody send me his uh, contact details? I, I have a card here. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you can do that. That would be lovely. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so we also have a children's sibling group. This came out of whims and uh, it was a need expressed by the parents uh, for the children. Because for the children, really, it's very hard if you're the sibling of somebody who has a disability. There are all sorts of pressures on you. I mean, not least of which <coughs> is maybe you're ashamed of your brother, your sister. You don't tell your friends at school that you have a, a brother or a sister with a, with a disability. Nobody understands. So we have a group that meets uh, one Saturday a month, and it's we have a group. There are about six groups within it because there are different age, age groups, but there's 30 children that, uh, that, that attend and just to share experiences to talk through with trained facilitators um, about what it's like to be the, the brother or sister of somebody with a disability and so the parents love it because like one of them said to me you know this is something that is focused entirely on my daughter this is her special thing she doesn't get a lot of that. This is her special thing. And she also said, went on to say, it's made, me, made us feel a lot more like a normal family. She said, but she was very careful to tell me, I don't condone violence, but she said, this was a really significant moment for me, was that um, her daughter got very annoyed with her brother because he was doing something that brothers do to really annoy him. And for a, for a change, she actually told him how annoyed she was with him and actually pushed him. And she, the mother thought that this was amazing because it really meant that through going to, to this group, she could actually start to see him as a brother and not as somebody who had to be protected. Um, so that's our uh, children's sibling group. 
Four all cylinder. Four. Good, Jim. We're coming to the end. Um, you can't really see this slide, so that's fine. I'll tell you what it says. <laughs> no, I'll just give you some uh, some numbers. We have. Uh, it says here three hundred. Oh, you told me there was a counter. Three hundred and two matches. I don't care. Oh, there. Look. Three hundred and two active matches. Uh, people who are supported, but we have about uh, 291 people, to be precise, on our waiting list. In the sort of the Kanata Nepean general area, I and mean, I only have some very uh, rough stats, we have about 32 of our matches are within that area. That's an advocate and somebody with a, some type of a disability, but they've got 50 people on the waiting list in, in just that area. And uh, the average time on a waiting list is about three years. Mm -hmm. We match based on um, best fit. So it's what the advocate's interests are and their personality as against the person with the, the disabilities, needs, wants, etc. So some people are on that waiting list for a very short amount of time because they just happen to hit the jackpot. And other people like John that I told you about wait much longer than that, uh, the, than that three years. Um, and within the Kanata and Nepean area, we've got four people who have lifetime networks. So it's, you know, it's, a, it's quite a good uh, number. Um, People always want to know how we're funded. So this is just a very quick graph of how we're funded. So this green thing is the Ministry of Community and Social Services. That's the provincial agency, and they're the ones supporting things like the uh, independent facilitation and planning. They do provide money for the Everyday Champions program and Transfusion Australia. We get some uh, money from the United Way, the City of Ottawa, the Trillium Foundation. Those are the uh, these smaller figures. This blue one here uh, is showing you that uh, in 2015. Uh, about 36% of the funds that we need to run were actually self-generated. We have a number of fundraising events um, that I could go into at nauseam, but we, you know, it's uh, an organisation that is supported very much by the community. Um, <clears throat> so, really? I'm at the end. Thank you.